Welcome everyone um, to this session of the Visual Poetics Seminar. Um, today we've got the pleasure of having Alec Barnes from QUT, who is going to talk about um, a project on grievable little lives <coughs> and images of children's death in conflict and crisis. Thank you, Alec. Super. Thank you so much uh, for all coming and for being here on a Friday afternoon. Um, I want to uh, start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're gathered on and paying my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. And to say thank you to Roland in absence um, for the invitation to come and uh, speak uh, to uh, you all today. It's nice to be back at UQ as well. <laughs> um, so I have a long-standing interest in children and young people. It's been the work that I've been doing for a long time now, I don't think how many years now, um, particularly in how they participate in peace and conflict. Um, and that was the, the work I did in my uh, PhD and work since then, particularly looking at um, peace building in Colombia and other parts of Latin America. But also as a necessary part of that work and increasingly in its own right, I've been looking at how children and young people are represented, how they come to appear um, in international relations and in global crises. <coughs> as part of that work, for many years I have thought and written about the appearance of injured and traumatised children in these spaces. <coughs> Sorry. So much so that both colleagues and even non-academic friends um, now send me the latest images every time they you know, come up on the, on, on, um, the social media and, and news sites, um, which is nice, <laughs> um, but often a lot in my Facebook <laughs> in, uh, message inbox. Um, in recent years, these kind of messages, both that I see and that, that get sent to me, um, seem to be increasingly, I don't want to say less of injured children, but more of dead children as well. And so I've been thinking how to make some kind of meaning from this, or some kind of sense from it. And it was in this thinking that a statement by the Israeli Prime Minister, Netanyahu, stuck out to me in 2014 and helped me start to think towards what I'm presenting on today. So <coughs> in July in 2014, um, Netanyahu gave an interview to CNN's Wolf Blitzer. Um, in, in that interview, he accused Hamas of facilitating the deaths of civilians in Gaza, and he made the following claim. He said, they want to pile up as many civilian dead as they can. I mean, it's gruesome. They use telegenically dead Palestinians for the cause. They want the more dead, the better. <coughs> so the comment came amidst the ongoing conflict, well, an escalation in the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas that occurred in July and August in 2014. But the notion of telegenic death particularly caught my attention <clears throat> in this statement because uh, Netanyahu's comment was specifically prompted by the death of four Palestinian boys who'd been killed by Israeli shelling while playing on the beach. And this idea of telegenic death contains a recognition that certain deaths, particularly in this case those of children, are particularly suited in some way for telecast and consumption. Telegenic implies appealing to view in some way. So what I want to do here is take this example and also three others um, as kind of starting points um, to uh, talk about um, the appearance of, of these images of children. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to describe this event and then I'm going to show you the image and then I'm going to do the same for the other, um, the other images as well. And then there aren't any other images in the presentation. In doing this um, and showing the images, I'm conscious of uh, work that's been done thinking about the, the um, presentation and circulation of uh, violent and, and traumatic images in different ways. Elizabeth Dauphiny talking about the Abu Ghraib photos, talking about, uh, she says, the mobilization of violent imagery produces an irresolvable ethical dilemma that <coughs> I confront in doing this work as well. Tom Gregory talks about the risk of fetishizing pain and reinforcing that boundary between us and them when we reproduce these images, and I'll return to that later as well. And Sharon Slawinski in some excellent work notes that as academics, we're not immune from that somehow as well, that we are also implicated in those power relations and things when we choose to show them. With those kind of caveats and acknowledging that, I've chosen here to show them in this way because while some might be well known, there's others that um, may not, and I also think it's important that we sit with and acknowledge what images we're talking about rather than abstract them here um, in the discussion that I'm going to have. <coughs> so, the first photos that relate specifically to this uh, point um, are uh, in Gaza. 
The four boys who were killed, that the comment refers to, were all members of the extended Makia family. Ahed, who was 11, Muhammad, who was 11, Zakaria, who was 10, and Ismail, who was 9. The deaths were captured because they occurred on the beach next to the hotel that was occupied by the foreign press. The first shell from an Israeli naval vessel hit fishermen's boats near where the boys were playing on the spit, prompting the boys to run away up the beach. The second shell hit the boys as they ran. The way the events unfold mean that there's actually a record of not just the aftermath, but of the moments immediately before and during because of the presence of the media. So as well as the photograph that perhaps we've come to expect about these kind of things, of the four boys laid out in body bags with their heads showing, there are other photographs, including of the boys running across the beach and others of the, the instance of destruction, as well as photos that then circulated um, of um, a man carrying one of the bodies mm -hmm. back across the beach. So it's these first three images that kind of appeared as a, as a triptych, as a set of three in my, time, in my Twitter timeline. <coughs> The first uh, images. So, this is a comfortable <laughs> sitting in so, people's sight line. The first images that I'm talking about there. Um, the second uh, image um, or images um, from September 2015, when Alan Kurdi, a three year old Syrian boy, drowned while trying to cross the Mediterranean with his family and was photographed lying on the shoreline of a Turkish beach. Kurdi's oldest son, five year old Gallup, mother Rihan or Rihanna, and at least 12 others from the same boat died that day. However, it was the photo of Alan Kurdi in particular um, in a red t-shirt, blue shorts, his shoes still on that went viral. <coughs> there were also other photos that circulated alongside this of the Turkish policeman uh, carrying his body away again across the sand. There was a lot of discussion around Kurdi's image, around the appropriateness of sharing it, concerns which largely focused on the so-called distressing nature of the image and whether viewers should have a choice about seeing it. And I note that the potential distress of relatives of Kurdi was not often considered in these discussions. So the second images, which perhaps are better known. The third image that I'm interested in here is actually the World Press photo winner from 2013, in which the bodies of two-year-old Suhaib Hijazi and his elder brother Muhammad, who is three and a half, are carried by their uncles to a mosque for their funeral. The um, uncles holding the bodies uh, followed down the narrow street by a large group of distraught men. The children were killed when their house was destroyed by an Israeli airstrike. The strike killed their father and severely injured their mother and four other siblings. So the third image. <coughs> the fourth image is from April this year when um, around 100 people were killed in a chemical gas attack on Khan Sheikh Khan in Syria. The images that most circulated in relation to this event were inescapable on my Twitter timeline, at least, was that of Abdil Hamid al Yusuf holding his dead nine-month-old twins, Ayer and Ahmed. al Yusuf lost 22 members of his family that day. In response to the images of al Yusuf and his children and the other images of children struggling to breathe following the attack that circulated, President Trump um, reportedly was moved and shocked at seeing the photos that he described as being of beautiful kids, which is worth interrogating in its own right, and launched vengeful retaliatory strikes. Um, in the fourth photos. So I want to take these uh, images, um, although they're not the only ones, but I'll take these images as a starting point to ask what we're talking about when we talk about telegenic death in this way. And to suggest that the deaths of children imagined in this statement by Netanyahu are particularly, as particularly suited to media attention. But I'm also interested in exploring how, in the consumption of images of dead children, there is a tension between the real fleshy bodies of deceased children and the symbolism that goes into their circulation. So in this paper, I'm not undertaking a specific analysis of images themselves, nor a quantitative analysis of the volume of their reproduction, although they acknowledge that there's valuable work to be done there, and that in other uh, spaces around images, um, work including that by Emma and Roland, as well as by David Campbell, Sharon Slinsky, Lena Hansen, and others have been doing that kind of work. I'm interested here in why these images are considered telegenic, and why images of dead children why and how images of dead children specifically shape what Connolly calls the conditions of possibility about how we think of images in these contexts. To do that, I want to start very briefly um, by talking about um, the, the broad um, way in which children feature when we talk about um, global crises. So children often feature in global politics. 
Um, they're invoked as touchstones of moral purity, of futurity, of hope, but also often as the damaged, violated victims whose treatment demonstrates the amorality of a particular group or government. Which children are seen, where they appear, and when they are mourned also tells us a lot about how we are to perceive a conflict or tragedy. Rarely asked to speak, the bodies of children become symbols of that catastrophe or cruelty. Questions of how uh, discourses uh, of security or protection of children construct children themselves are increasingly being asked within IR, and Marshall Beer and Cecilia Jacob in particular are doing some great work there. While children are presented as decontextualised innocent victims, their bodies are politicised through the judgement that accrues to their societies and the invisible frames that make them visible to international audiences. Susan Moller argues that it's not that, no, it's not that children should not appear in media. Sometimes it's important that we acknowledge that they're there. However, to quote Moller, when the media shill their stories with wide-eyed orphans, there are consequences. Such pictures are riveting in an almost nauseous way because they eliminate the nuances, inconsistencies and complexities that are an essential component of political society. Being critical about how and where children appear is crucial. However, being critical about how and where dead children appear in particular requires considering which bodies appear and why, as well as which bodies are not appearing in these spaces. So to do that, I have to look at bodies. Um, and luckily for me, there has been um, important and detailed attention to bodies in international relations, particularly in the last decade or so, <coughs> about the presence of bodies, both living and dead. So the Abu Ghraib photos are an important site of examination of how living bodies are made abject, objectified and inscribed with various power relations. And Elizabeth Dorfany, as well as Sontag and Butler, among many others, have explored the violence against um, bodies in these photos. Military violence against bodies has also been explored. For example, outstanding work by Thomas Gregory, uh, looking at the so-called Afghan kill team of US soldiers who killed, dismembered and photographed the body of an unarmed boy, uh, Afghan boy, uh, Gul Madin, challenges the ways in which we comprehend pain and violence against the body in war. While other work that Gregory's done on civilian death in Afghanistan contributes to understanding the livability and grievability of bodies. Lauren Wilcox has examined spectacular death and violence through close feminist attention to gendered bodies and the abject bodies of suicide bombers, as well as bodies more broadly through um, her book, which I commend to all of you, and Jessica Orkter has been talking about the role of dead bodies in security studies uh, in particular. And again, that's been excellent work. These are all close exceptional works on violence towards bodies in IR, and they contribute much to our understanding of the politics of the body as an explicit site of analysis. In focusing on dead children's bodies rather than just children in distress, I follow these and others working in this space to argue for the importance of the corpse as a significant subject in IR, and one that we need to confront directly. Jessica Orchter explains that dead bodies are complex. They have both emotional and evidentiary value. They pose important questions for security frameworks, including what happens when they're thrust onto the scene in a way that is unexpected or taboo. So in this work then, I'm interested in how these images of children are presented and how does the physical evidence of death and pain that is inflicted upon children in them challenge contemporary frameworks in which to follow Butler, some lives are apprehendable as living and some are not. So that's where I move to next. So in seeing those bodies that are often overlooked in international relations discourse, those bodies which are often constructed as the accidental or tragic outcome of necessary conditions rather than a fundamental constitutive part of doing international politics, we can argue that the body is not only produced but can, that can not only produced but can be productive. And as I say, Lauren Wilcox, um, in her Bodies of Violence, um, argues this in um, really excellent detail. The conceit of much traditional IR is its willful ignoring of the fleshy bodies that the practices of state making and war create. And feminist IR scholars have for decades now, through their attention to gender and diverse identities in the sphere of war, opened space to consider different bodies seriously in international relations. Inherent in this work, though, is still choices about what bodies are made visible in discourse, and still in all of them, the bodies of children and young people are not given meaningful consideration. So in order to try and speak meaningfully of the dead bodies of children, I turn to Judith Butler for help. So Butler's work, um, particularly in Precarious Lives in 2004 and Frames of War in 2010, gives an account of life that is precarious and vulnerable. For Butler, the precariousness of bodies and life 
comes about to quote her as a result of living socially, that is the fact that one's life is always in some sense in the hands of the other. However, the grievability of a human life is also differentiated due to social and political posi positionalities. Butler draws attention to this difference by asking who is recognised as we in the global political community. She asks whose lives are considered valuable, whose lives are mourned, and whose lives are considered ungrievable. For Butler, a grievable life is one that has been lived and can be apprehended as such. And Butler argues the counter to this is, to quote her, a life that will never have been lived, sustained by no regard, no testimony, and ungrieved when lost. Life must be apprehended by others, and others determine how and why another life is included in those lives that are considered valuable. So then we have to ask how or why lives are how or why lives are apprehended as living and thus grievable. The vulnerability of bodies and their precariousness differs in different locations also. Lauren Wilcox argues that what Butler's work does nicely is outline how our bodies are, to quote Wilcox, ontologically vulnerable, whereby certain lives are not considered lives at all. Thus, when they are killed, they're not intelligible as human at all. Butler argues it's not just that a death is poorly marked, it's that it's unmarkable. Such a death vanishes not into explicit discourse, but into the ellipses by which public discourse proceeds. Butler argues that those bodies which are not regarded as grievable and valuable are also then, in the international system, made to bear the burden of starvation, unemployment, sorry, underemployment, legal disenfranchisement, and of interest here particularly, differential exposure to violence and death. In the contemporary environment, we can recognise these conditions um, where we do not regard certain populations as grievable. For instance, those suffering individuals whose experience and presence constitutes a so-called Mediterranean migrant crisis, the victims of drone attacks, civilians enduring serious civil war and many other wars. Some bodies, though, are intelligible because they've complied with various norms. However, bodies that have been subject to quote Wilcox, subject to normative violence, are often then able to be subjected to the forms of violence that IR is more comfortable theorising. And here Wilcox is talking about torture, drone death, enhanced security measures, and so on. So it's evident then in the global circulation of power and privilege and the maintenance of political norms, certain bodies are erased. Or perhaps more accurately than erased, these bodies were never seen as bodies to be counted at all. However, some bodies are seen, are framed and counted and reproduced. And so I'm interested then in how these certain bodies appear and why we see these bodies in certain ways. <coughs> As noted, the dead bodies that have been the focus of IR theorising to date have largely been those which have been rendered ungrievable, torture victims, um, Afghan civilians, drone victims, etc. I'm interested here, though, in these deaths that transgress their exposure to normative violence, which is what I'm arguing that the, the um, children's bodies do. I'm interested in the fact that Palestinians are constructed as ungrievable, yet Netanyahu's invocation of telegenic death raises the Bakir children to a level that can be uh, apprehended as life and thus grievable. Mediterranean migrants die in their thousands, but Kurdi's, <coughs> Kurdi's body complies with certain uh, bodily norms um, and thus can be apprehended as a life that should have been lived. Aya and Ahmed al-Yusuf brought government officials in the US and here in Europe to tears and declarations of emotion and the launching of weapons and thus was uh, 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 able to be understood as uh, lives. Me. David Campbell talks about photojournalism as somatic, that is, it relies on images of individuals to convey broader social images. These images are not simple, but rather to follow Harriman and Lucates are, to quote, individuated aggregate. According to this notion, images of suffering depict individuals as singular, however, to quote Campbell, they depict collective experience metonymically by reducing a general construct to a specific embodiment. Lena Hansen also draws on this idea to forward the idea of an icon, and she moves their definition to the realm of the international to talk about images that are widely circulated and emotionally responded to. If international icons to follow Hansen, such as Curdie's photograph, have emotional and evidentiary power to follow Orkda, how might we understand the complexities of representing pain and suffering through images such as that of Curdie's or any of the, the images here? Is it possible to conceive of their actual suffering or death, or as Dauphiny argues, the, the symbolic coming to stand in for the real in these cases? 
I think it's also really crucial to note that Ahmed, Mohammed, Zakaria, and Ismail Bakir, as well as Alan Kurdi, as well as Suha and Muhammad Hijazi and Aya and uh, Ahmed El Youssef, were only mournable in death. Their lives as children were not able to be apprehended as living. And I believe there are two considerations in terms of framing here. One is to do with the fact that they are children. Oh, I say there's two, because there's many others I'm going to talk about too here. One is to do with the fact that they are children, which we've been talking about through this presentation so far, and the universalizing nature of images of children. Their status as children and these assumptions that attach to their bodies allows their deaths to be apprehendable, to be circulated by images of tweets and news articles. To invoke Sontag, this distance allows us to engage with violences while remaining distant from us. These bodies are enough like us to apprehend them as living, but different enough to be made visible in ungainly spread limb death. Yeah, good. Okay. I, was, I had not clicked over for the Dolphin quote from before. <laughs> um, but when Curdie's tiny body lies on the shore, it looks like it could be any tiny child, but it's also the fact that he is Syrian, one of thousands of bodies from the global south trying to reach Europe that make his image appropriate for circulation. And we'll return to this point in a moment. And before I do that, the other frame that I'm interested here in thinking about things through is that of gender and the iconography of perhaps the motherly or parenting bond that is inherent in these photos. This particular idea is more recent in the work I'm doing and it's been prompted by thinking about images of children not only lying alone on the seaside, but children mourned and held by family. So if there's a universalizing pool of images that I've just discussed, there are these other things at work also. Images of a mother bent low in pain, a grieving father, reoccur throughout humanitarian and war photography. And I argue here, as others have, that photographs of suffering and crisis rely on and reproduce images like this because they are in some way iconographic. So Zika argues that this is, she calls it, symbolic accessibility, where tropes are deployed because, to quote her, they're safely communicable in their universality. What strikes me is in the presence of images in the last few years, and I'm not saying it's only in the last few years, but of these images I'm looking at, are those of men holding their dead children. And I think it's perhaps important to pay attention to gender in the framing of these images. Or rather, more specifically, we need to consider the intimate expression of grief displayed by men in these situations and ask why they resonate in the West when usually men are seen as violent or dangerous. What is going on here? And I have been thinking about, uh, in doing this, as I say, this is, the, this is um, new, uh, less developed thinking as part of the, the project as a whole, but I've been thinking about Christian iconography uh, in relation to these images, um, and particularly the figure of the Virgin Mary and child, as well as the image of the Pieta, which is uh, the grieving Mary um, with the dead body of Christ draped over her, which is the recurring image, as points of reference for these photographs to ask whether we can understand images like that of Al Yosef clutching his twins as both emblematic of empathy and the mourning of parenthood and also as a call to witness ourselves through the photographic evidence of their dead bodies, which is, uh, invokes some of the things inherent in the Pieta. And to think about whether the positioning of bodies in these images of his and the twins or the Palestinian men holding the shrouded uh, nephews help invoke bodies which are grievable because they are inscribed with or overlaid with iconography that whether consciously or not is intelligible to the audience that is viewing the images. Um, I can come back and talk about that in the future when I've thought about it some more. Um, but I think it's important to, to note, and I think that the, the gender connotations there are really important to draw out as well. The last thing I want to, to consider here, and as I said, I would return to it when I was talking about uh, Alan before, is who we're not seeing when we're seeing these images. So if we're seeing these broken, dead bodies of children, which bodies aren't we seeing still? And Sontag notes that it's always the image that someone chose to photograph is to frame, and to frame is to exclude. The boys on the beach in Gaza made headlines because their deaths occurred next to a hotel populated by journalists. Alan Kurdi was photographed by Nilou Fadimir, who was a, a photographer with the Turkish Dogen News Agency. However, Damir has described the beach to quote her as a children's graveyard that day, with several other bodies of children lying nearby. She photographed adults who died on beaches in the weeks before, and she photographed other bodies on the beach that day, but it was Curdie's photo that captured the world's attention. 
Butler argues, and um, Azule has some um, interesting things to say around these things also, but Butler argues that the frames through which we apprehend or indeed fail to apprehend the lives of others as lost or injured, losable or injurable, are politically saturated, the evidence of functions of power, and that we should interrogate them. And so it's important to ask why we see these deaths. What hierarchy of childhood is evident when we circulate, retweet, publish images of small brown bodies? The victims we see to illustrate these disasters often look different to the consumers of those images. Tanya Steele argues that, brown, to quote her, brown children only matter when it's time to illustrate grief and suffering. She asks whether this regale of brown dead bodies is actually causing us to devalue these lives, and I think it's something to think about further. Emma Hutchinson argues that photographs of disaster and crisis are also saturated with colonial overtones. She talks about a politics of pity that distinguishes between those who suffer and those who do not, and which is laden with power that helps, to quote her, constitute hierarchical relationships between the different actors. I think here we return to these questions of lives as apprehendable. Our choices in displaying their deaths are linked, I argue, in, to our ability to grieve them. So to conclude in this paper, uh, some conclusions rather than to conclude perhaps. Um, in this paper, I've attempted to begin an understanding towards how the embodied deaths of children both sit in tension with, but also facilitate the reproduction and consumption of images of their deaths. The appearance of dead children, perhaps more than any other dead body in international politics, can be argued as indicative of a failure of the system. However, there are important questions about the production of dead children as a consequence of the <coughs> natural way of functioning in the international system. And so I think it's incumbent on us and pressing on us to ask how we can better theorise their deaths, how we can better theorise the presence of their dead bodies in crisis and conflict. I think we should ask how we consume their mediatised deaths. And if to follow Sontag, children's deaths are what we have left to shock us into knowledge about situations in other parts of the world, what obligations do we have when considering sharing images of their deaths? The process of encountering, of staying with the idea of children's dead bodies as politically significant, of thinking meaningfully about their appearance is fraught. Our ability to recognise other lives that are grievable is dependent on the fundamental sociality of our lives that Butler talks about. This both allows us to live but also makes us vulnerable. Butler argues that we cannot will away this vulnerability. She argues we must attend to it, even abide by it, as we begin to think about what politics might be implied by staying with the thought of our corporeal vulnerability itself, a situation in which we can be vanquished or lose others. Our vulnerability is predicated on our capacity to recognise <coughs> others and to mourn their deaths. The fact children's deaths are particularly telegenic <coughs> should raise questions for how we understand relationships on a, global, on a global scale, for their deaths and our lives are intricately connected, and questions of security and of rights and of responsibility must be asked when we confront these images. If we have apprehended these young children as grievous <coughs> lives, what consequences does that now have for how we think about the lives that we do not apprehend? The notion of telegenic death needs further interrogation beyond what I've uh, commenced here, and I think particularly <coughs> fruitfully in, how it re in regards to how it sits with the well-established aesthetic term in IR, as well as the emotional register of engaging with these deaths, which I have engaged with uh, a little bit, but not here in this presentation. Certain children are made visible. The spectacles of their death necessitates more critical engagement with what their appearance contributes to how dead bodies as subjects are understood in international relations and how we analyse, encounter and meet with the images of their deaths in international crises. Thank you.